Welcome to another SSE show. Tonight's an interesting one, folks, if you like boxing, and actually if you like entertainment, and if you like comedians, and if you like going to Las Vegas, this guy knows it all. Stephen Lott, the president of the Boxing Hall of Fame. We're going to get to him in a moment. I want to thank everybody that shows up. Great folks that always show up. Anthony Ramos, thank you. Wave. All right. <laughs> Diana Ridley. Keith Knox, he's going to be showing photos tonight, so he can't wave. Ronnie, thanks for showing up. And Charles Hogue, the excellent producer as always, one of the greatest producers of all time. All right, Stephen Lott. This guy's got 20,000 items that are going to be featured in the Boxing Hall of Fame. Now, what's interesting, Stephen, that I, I, I'm i blown away by this. You've got pictures. When you said turn of century, I was thinking 2000. You've got photos from boxing in the, what, 1900s? Uh, tell us how you got involved in boxing. How did you get all this stuff? Uh, tell us a little about yourself. Well, thanks very much. Basically, the uh, company I worked with was called Big Fights Incorporated. The uh, owners of the company uh, managed some great fighters, but in addition, they were in the business of buying fight films. Every fight film from the turn of the century from 1900 through 2000. Ali, Lewis, Dempsey, Marciano, it was wonderful watching, editing the films all day. In addition to the films, they collected thousands and thousands of photographs. And over the years, their ambition was to build a boxing hall of fame in Las Vegas in a very high traffic area. So I've carried on that uh, desire for them and finally got a terrific spot at the Luxor Hotel, putting in a lot of great boxing stuff, films, being right in between baseball, football, basketball, other halls of fame at the Luxor. It's a great, great spot. And you've been part of uh, not just getting all, gathering all this, you've actually helped ESPN create documentaries. You've helped uh, uh, almost be like a director in a way, creating this, these cool clips and stuff. How exciting was that? What were some of the more interesting stories of putting this stuff together? Well, first of all, it's always exciting to be uh, watching Muhammad Ali, Joe Lewis, Jack Dempsey all day long, uh, to have ABC, CBS, or NBC call and say, gee, we're looking for a fight of Muhammad Ali in Manila. When was that? Well, that was 1975. To be the expert of the fight films, to know when a round ended, when a knockout occurred, uh, to put film features together on Ray Robinson and Marciano and Lewis, and to know what films exist and what don't without having to look at a database. Meeting the fighters, that was the best part. Meeting Ali and Joe Lewis, Jack Dempsey, they're, it's, they're fantastic. It's like meeting Mickey Mantle or Willie Mays. And if you work with them and work with champions, it's even better. How did you get so hooked into this? How did you get involved? Why are you passionate about it? And where do you see yourself and this Boxing Hall of Fame going? Well, the, uh, I was the national handball champion. And the world's champion owned the fight film company that had all these films. It was a passion of knowing that boxers are very special. It's a one-on-one -on -one sport. There's no team. It's up to you. Physically, mentally, emotionally, it's one-on-one. -on -one. The athlete of the century of 1900 to 2000, most publications and organizations voted Muhammad Ali. No one knows this, but of the 1800s, the fighter or person voted athlete of the century was John L. Sullivan, a fighter from Boston. So that means for the past two centuries, the athlete of the century has been a boxer. That means something, to have fighters like that above baseball, football, basketball. They're just wonderful, wonderful athletes and superstars. Huh. Okay, so you've watched uh, countless film over, what, 100 years of film of boxing, okay? Yes. Tell me who you think. I've always heard Muhammad Ali. Mike Tyson's been thrown in there at times, you know? Who would you say is the greatest boxer? Don't give me lightweight, heavyweight, featherweight. I don't care. Just who's the greatest boxer of all time? Well, I'd have to say Muhammad Ali. But usually I break it down because it's the most well-known, most revered, pound for pound, and most exciting. Four different categories. Revered would be Joe Lewis. Most well-known, well, that's Ali. Most exciting of all time, that would be Mike Tyson. And pound for pound would be probably Sugar Ray Leonard. Okay. You said most exciting. I don't man, that's interesting because most people say Muhammad Ali was most exciting. You're saying it's Tyson. Why? That's a great question. If you put a Tyson fight on TV and a Muhammad Ali fight on TV 
and you turned off the sound and you didn't know who was fighting. In about 20 seconds, with the Ali fight, you'd go up and get a beer because there's nothing happening in the fight. With Tyson, you don't want to leave the screen for a second. You're saying to yourself, holy mackerel, this guy's an animal. That's what boxing should be all the time. If boxing was like that more and more, people would not be watching baseball, football. They'd be watching boxing. And for everybody uh, watching online and everybody in this hangout, be watching Keith Knox. He's going through a lot of interesting photos that you've gathered over the years. Uh, there's one right there, Muhammad Ali. What is that one all about? Uh, that's Muhammad Ali uh, in uh, 1963. Uh, he was a very big clowner, and uh, he was going to fight a guy named Archie Moore, very old guy. Muhammad Ali always liked to use poems for his opponents, and this one I can see it's small. It says, Moore in four. He liked to use <laughs> say when his fighters, his opponents could get knocked out. All right, Ronnie. Ronnie's got a question from the gallery. Ronnie, go ahead. Yeah, my question is about promotion. Why do you think that when boxing is promoted the way it is, it makes such a big impact for the name of the boxer? In other words, a boxer is more famous than a whole team, necessarily. Why, do you think it's because it's focused on one individual, or what do you think the reasons are that make boxing as name available? You know, everybody's aware of these names, even though they might not even follow boxing, but they're aware of it. What is it about it that does that? Well, that's a great question. In the world of boxing fans, they would know a lot of fighters. Uh, the general public, they would know the big guys, the real big marquee names. And they would know them because they'd be in the big pay-per-view events that are advertised by HBO and Showtime. So the PR and marketing of the superstars, like Mayweather and Pacquiao and some of these other young fighters, that makes the mainstream audience aware of them. The boxing audience, they'll know everyone, but the mainstream audience, only the big, big guys. Okay, that's a good point. Uh, we have Anthony Ramos. You got a question? Yeah, um, going back to all the all the famous of the past, you know, hundred years. What do you think was the most exhilarating match of like the past hundred years? Uh, exhilarating is a tough one. Um, uh, that would be. Uh, you know, Hagler fought a guy named Tommy Hearns in 83, 84. I remember that fight. Yeah. And uh, that fight is considered probably the most exciting fight of all time. The most dramatic fight of all time is also con considered the most dramatic sports moment of all time. That was Joe Lewis in 1938 defending against a German, Max Schmeling. Considered the most dramatic sporting event in history, World War II, Nazi, who had beaten Lewis two years prior. But when an event in boxing is big, it's big. It's really exciting. Um, why, why do you think, okay, here's, here's the thing about boxing, okay? Why is it so exciting to see two guys beat each other up? I mean, people always ask that. Uh, why is that? Well, um, that's a good question. Um, I think it's because of the excitement, number one, that they're the center stage. I don't know about you, but as an athlete, I, I wouldn't mind being in Wimbledon playing Bjorn Borg or John McEnroe and having that spotlight on me. I think in a super big fight, even women watching on TV would wish they were the center of attraction. They were the center of attention. I know I would, and I would be like, I'd like to get that $40 million payday also and walk out of the ring the champion. All those factors roll into one. All right. Diana, you had a question. Um, boxers, what qualities do they possess? I mean, like Mike Tyson, what qualities did you like seeing in him while he was boxing? Every fighter has to have certain things uh, to make them a champion. It's uh, a measure of mostly uh, their emotional stability. That would be very tough emotionally. As Strange as that sounds, most fighters are emotional and they have to be able to control that. They're not robots. They're very emotional. They have to have a handle on that. As they get older, they do. They have to be incredibly physically fit. They have to have what's called a chin. If they get hit, they have to be able to absorb the punishment. They have to be in great shape. They have to go 12 rounds. You need a little bit of everything. And the guys usually, a great expression was, will will always triumph over skill. And in boxing, that's usually the case. 
even if a fighter is very talented, uh, a fighter with better will, more heart, will win in that fight. But you need a little bit of everything. And when a guy has a lot of everything, well, then you get Ali and you get Mike Tyson and you get a sensational superstar. Okay, we talked about most exhilarating fights. You said Hagler versus Hearns. Keith just brought up something on your profile. That's Rocky Balboa. Of his fights, um, was it the Russian that was interesting, or who? Oh, what was, oh, which one of his was the most exciting? And could a boxer really take that abuse that uh, Rocky took? Well, it's interesting. Two things about the uh, Rocky series. Uh, the uh, uh, Rocky film, uh, the first one, is the first time that a sports film won the Academy Award as best film. Rocky. No okay. other sports film had won, number one. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, even the first uh, athlete, the first sports movie was The Champ with Wallace Beery in 19. That was a great movie. Yeah. He won Best Actor but didn't win Best Film. Uh, Raging Bull is considered one of the great films of all time. It did not win Best Film. It was uh, Robert De Niro won Best Actor that year. Uh, but Rocky was the first uh, sports film that won Academy Award. Wow. Yeah. Interestingly enough about Hollywood, there have been more films made on boxing in Hollywood than any other sport, more than baseball, football, basketball, and the AFI, the American Film Institute, every 10 years votes the greatest 100 films of all time. They have a voting. The last three have been about the same. There are six sports films. Five are boxing. No baseball, no football, no basketball. You know, it's Rocky, Raging Bull, uh, City Lights, where Charlie Chaplin plays a boxer, on the waterfront, where, of course, Marlon Brando is the boxer, Pulp Fiction, where Bruce Willis is the boxer, and Rocky. Uh, that's how big Rocky is, that series. Yeah, right. And but, but there's no boxer that could have taken that abuse, could they have? Well, the, the interesting thing about the Rocky series is that he's the first actor to be able to choreograph the fight in such a way place the camera in a position where the punches look like they're landing. Every other Hollywood movie, the actor may believe he's taking the hit. Very poorly choreographed. But you're right. The fighters could not take that punishment. But if, <laughs> if a fight was like that, people would be standing and cheering for weeks. You know? People that people watch a lot on YouTube, uh, they don't ever want to come on. They just want to watch. So if you're watching on YouTube, uh, ask us questions. Or you can also tweet uh, SSC Show hashtag. We get about half a million to a million impressions on Twitter. Tweet away, folks. Ronnie's got a question. Yeah, I know you're biased, but why do you think boxing is such a big deal with uh, movies and stuff like that? What's the deal? That's a great question. Uh, two reasons. Number one, it's easy to shoot. The, the, the ring is like a stage. The yeah. camera can be placed right there. Baseball, football, basketball is a huge field. It's tough to shoot. You got all the players on the field. Uh, the cameras have to be placed all over. You got all the all the all cameras necessary. For boxing, it was easy to shoot. You can focus on one key character, and for some reason, it captivated the director's fancy. Everyone from Hitchcock to um, uh, uh, the uh, uh, John Ford and uh, the uh, directors who directed. Uh, science fiction movies, uh, Stanley Kubrick, his first two films were uh, boxing films. So it comes, it, it comes down to logistics. I mean, it's logistics, you know, at yes. the beginning, and then it's set a, set a precedence. It's, there's no precedent. It's logistics and the story of a fighter trying to overcome, usually. That's the key thing. And that could be in baseball, football as well. But for the boxing, it's that fighter, his emotions, and overcoming. Interesting. Hmm. Okay. That is. That's cool. Okay, so we've got 15 minutes. We're halfway through the show. Let's get into some good stuff now. Everybody wants to talk about Mike Tyson, always about Mike Tyson. Why is he so big? What are some of your more interesting stories from Tyson? Um, you hear things, I mean, biting ears, the stuff, you know, all the, the prison, the, the, all that crazy stuff. What, tell us about him that maybe people haven't heard. Or tell us some uh, stories that you know about him. Well, number one, the roller coaster ride of his life, uh, going from where he was in Brooklyn as a street punk to 1986, 87, 88, being voted the world's most popular athlete, commercials on TV, hired to do spokesperson roles by the New York City Police Department, FBI, the DEA, then the downward spiral, way down back to prison, 
Then coming back up again now to hang out and the uh, iPhone application is one man show. That spectrum, that roller coaster, I don't know if any human in the history of the planet went through that. And nothing around Mike happened by accident. It was all, all carefully, calculatingly planned. Customato, Jim Jacobs, Bill Caton, the original group, steered Mike in the right direction, resulting in him becoming a hero. Don King, Robin Givens, calculatingly to steal the money, put him in a hellhole. The, it, nothing happened by accident. Mike, one-on-one, -on -one, sensational kid, sensational. If he's surrounded by, by nice people, most people know that children, they'd like their kids surrounded by good kids. If they're good kids, they may turn out to be good. But if they're not good kids, that can rub off also. So Mike's life, when you're surrounded by good people, sensational. But there's some very bad people out there, and Robin Givens and Don King are at the bottom of that list. Is that right? Why is that? Why do you say that? Well, when you look at Mike's, that's a great question. When you look at Mike's life, it's interesting that 84, 85, 86, 87, 88, no problems, commercials on TV, making millions of dollars, didn't fall into the pressure of the fights, didn't succumb to the money, fine, sleeping on my couch for three years. Uh, he he slept on kid. your couch? Yes, for three he years. Didn't, yes. Did he bite your ear? No, he took me out for a bite once in a while, though. He did? <laughs> So yeah. what was that like, Mike Tyson staying in your house? What, uh, uh, what, what, what? That's I don't even know how to respond to that. I've never heard something like that. I've never heard this story, and I do research. Well, what happened was that Customato, his original teacher, permitted Mike to come to the city after each fight for a day, as relaxation. And the manager, trainer, Customato knew me. He asked if Mike can sleep on my couch, stay with me for that one day. When Mike was fighting more often. It was only one day at a time. As the weeks and months went by, he would fight more than, let's say, every two months. He'd sleep there for, for three or four days. Then it was a week, then three weeks. Then eventually it was a month, sleeping on my couch. He loved being around friends. He never said boo, never had a problem, and uh, he was just a wonderful kid to, to, to live with. Terrific friend, sensational friend. Really? Yeah. So I've never heard anybody say Mike Tyson is a, a terrific and a great person and a friend. This is interesting to me, okay, because you always hear the negative stuff. Uh, how hard was it for you then if you were a friend to see the downfall and you said he got into hell, basically hell, uh, how hard was that for you as a friend seeing that? Well, that's a great question. Actually, uh, you're one of the few people who have ever asked that question. And I, I have, I've always been told that I always ask an interesting question. My name is Mopra, the male version of Oprah. That's what I do for a living. Go ahead. You need some more makeup, but that's beside the point. <laughs> I know. No, I need more hair like you. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, it was like having uh, your son. You develop your son. You take care of him. He goes through college, becomes a professor. Uh, he becomes a doctor. Uh, he discovers the cure for cancer, and then uh, he meets some people who instill in him some uh, sensitivities, some uh, very bad things, some bad habits. They get him hooked on drugs. Uh, he loses his job. He loses his family. Uh, he gets in car crashes. Uh, he hurts somebody. He kills somebody. Your son is in prison now after making him so wonderful a person. So with me, it's the same thing with Tyson. He was like my son. And seeing him in that hellhole with 1990. 2, 93, 94, the prison, uh, it was very painful. It was very painful, even to today. So um, uh, when I see him in the old glory days, it's wonderful. But I know that he suffered tremendously during that time period. It hurt me a lot. Wow. Okay. Then how about him now? Okay, we've talked about him great, him horrible. What about now? What's he like now? How's his mindset? When have you recently talked to him? And what kind of things is he going through? Well, Mike now is getting better and better in terms of his uh, emotional stability. He's getting happier. It's tough going from where he was uh, through prison, the ear biting, all that stuff. It's not like, remember, he can't disappear when he goes out to buy a cup of coffee like you and I. If something happened in our lives, people really wouldn't know what we did. With Mike, everywhere he went, he could hear people talking about him. That's not something you dismiss if you're emotional. If you're human, you pick that up, you don't like it. It bothers you. But that's happening less and less because 
his demeanor now is better. He's not getting into any problems. He's not having any uh, uh, incidences in any way. The more and more he conducts himself like this, he'll be more and more happier. And that's why he's getting these opportunities with uh, the Hangover film and the One Man Show and the commercials he's doing. So he's get, he's he's getting happier. It's good. And these are great stories, man. We appreciate you sharing all this stuff. It's some insight, quite frankly, that I've never heard, and uh, that's always great. Always when you hear new stuff. Ronnie, you've got a question. Yeah, can you tell us about those pictures behind you? I'm, I'm somehow feeling they mean a little bit more to you than they might the average person. Well, uh, they a couple of them are very important. Uh, the one here to my to my uh, side is a poster of uh, Mike Tyson winning the heavyweight championship in 1986. And uh, it was signed by both Mike and his opponent, uh, Trevor Burbick. Burbick died about 10 years ago, so oh, you know, wow. too, many, too many autographs from him. Uh, right behind me is a great shot of a, a documentary feature on Muhammad Ali. Doesn't look quite like Ali, but uh, it's a Which little bit. Which one is that one? Do you mind pointing to that one real quick? Yeah, right. I'm going to move it like that. Right behind me right here. Okay. That's Muhammad Ali. Okay. okay. Uh, to my right, down below, that's another Muhammad Ali motion picture. He starred in a film in his life called The Greatest. He played himself in The Greatest. Yeah. Uh, to my side here is a great film with Barbara Streisand. Yes. Ryan O'Neill. Main event. Yeah, it was called Main Event. Yes. Uh, he played a corner man uh, with Ryan O'Neill, and uh, uh, she did a very good job. That was her one boxing role. And the artwork to my corner, I commissioned it's Muhammad Ali and Mike Tyson in the ring, like a what if fight if they fought each other. So, uh, you know, uh, I'd pay to see that fight, by the way. That's Great. awesome. I love yeah. it, man. Good question, Ronnie. Okay, Keith has got some more photos up there. Do you remember that one, Tyson versus King? What is that? Um, in, uh, the, and tell uh, everybody real quick for people just joining in. By the way, we've got Steve Lott, the president of the Boxing Hall of Fame, opening up in Las Vegas. So get out there. 20,000 items of photos and videos and all kinds of stuff and stories from the boxing uh, world from 18, like 1500, the gladiator time, to 2000, right? Well, <laughs> Tell well, us. The gladiators didn't wear gloves. They wore shields, but that's okay. Okay, so whatever. I'm just kidding. You know what I mean. So sure. about 100 years of boxing uh, uh, stuff. Uh, here we got Tyson versus King. Uh, tell us some of the more interesting photos you have. You don't have to talk about this one specifically, but we just want to show our viewers. Tell us some of the more interesting ones you have and the one more meaningful ones you have. Well, the, the most emotional ones, of course, I shot Mike doing everything. When we were traveling together, I was the uh, butler, I was the cook, I was the cleaner. There were no uh, groupies. There were no entourage. It was just myself the trainer, Kevin Rooney, and, and Mike. Uh, and Mike liked it like that. So I shot Mike doing everything. The cover you see here is when Mike was suing Don King for the half a billion dollars that Don appropriated for Mike over the years. And wow. they finally went out of that court. So, but with Mike, I shot him with great fighters, with his family, with friends. And um, uh, the, the one interesting story is he was always very amiable about getting shot. One time, I'm in the can here in Vegas, the door pops open. This is 1987. He's standing in front of me with my big camera. Click. He takes me, takes a shot of me on the can. I say, Mike, you, <laughs> you finally got me. Okay. I developed the film. He gets me from the head up. I said, Mike, you didn't even get, catch my whole body. He said, oh, man, that's only got your head. Damn, man. So he's not a good photographer. He's a great fighter. <laughs> but he's not a photographer. Anybody got a question, let us know. Raise your hand. Do it in the chat. Charles has a question. Produce the show. No questions for you. I do. I do. There's a there's a picture on your on your stream on your Google Plus stream of Mike Tyson laughing at you dancing. Yes. Can we hear the story? Where sure. you go, Charles? Yeah. Uh, Mike was fighting in upstate New York in a place called Colony, New York. Uh, a very an undercard fight in uh, November of '85, and uh, I was in the dressing room with him. He always had some music playing uh, in, in the background, and I started to groove a little bit. And he looked at me, he said, no, Steve, don't do that. It's not your style. I said, no, let me, let me show you what I can do. He said, Steve, no. You and I started to dance. He, he tried to be very uh, you know, uh, kind, but he couldn't hold it in. He started to burst out laughing. 
And the more he laughed, the more I danced. I said, screw it, I'm going to dance anyway. But uh, he, he knows what a good dancer is, and I am not that person. <laughs> Folks, we got about five, about now four minutes. We're going to keep going. If you got a question, you better pop it in because we're running out of time here. Uh, Stephen, man, some great stories here. Um, hey, that couch, that couch thing. When was the last time he was on your couch? Um, he lived with me from late '84 to around October '87. So in 1987, uh, he moved out of my apartment to an apartment in the same building. And uh, he didn't even want to leave the building, but he slept on the couch. Sometimes he just crashed on the floor. He had no car then, no jewelry, no clothing. I'd wash out my, my underwear, and my jockey shorts are all stretched out. I said, Mike, man, get your own underwear. He said, no, nah, I don't want to buy anything. I'll wear yours. That was Mike. <laughs> and you were once a boxer. You told a funny story. How good were you? I was a terrific boxer. I boxed for one year. But I had to stop because I had trouble with my hands, you know. The referee kept stepping on them. And uh, after a while, it was too painful. That means you got knocked out a hundred times. <laughs> yeah. Mostly by women, but some fighters. Why does boxing have the controversial uh, attitude that it has, the promotional attitude that it has? And do you think the sport is, I don't know, it used to be more popular in the 1890s. What do you think about it now? Uh, in the... 1900s, of course, it was much bigger than baseball, football, basketball. Uh, now, baseball, football, basketball is bigger. The there is no great. Does white that fight. hurt you in a way? Your feelings? Uh, no, I can't blame the audience because there's no great white fighter out there. If there was a great white fighter, a young Jack Dempsey or Rocky Marciano, white America would go, "Holy mackerel! We're not going to watch football today. We're going to watch this kid fight." If there was a young black fighter coming up who was another Sugar Ray Leonard or another Joe Lewis, another Mike Tyson, they'd watch that. The good thing for boxing is the Hispanic audience. That's huge. Every fight on Showtime, on HBO, ESPN is Rodriguez versus Ortiz, or Torres versus Rodriguez. They love boxing and baseball, and boxing's the number one. So while there is no Joe Lewis or Jack Dempsey around today, the young Hispanic kids are really doing a sensational job in the ring. They're fantastic. You are obviously creating something very cool. The photos, the stories are fantastic. Um, if you could, okay, I, I know you're not going to get back into it and not get involved, but if you could and you could turn the sport around, what would you do and what would be the first move you'd make? Uh, the key thing would be to develop a bigger amateur boxing program. The more talent you have, it's a talent pool, the better chance you have of developing a great fighter, a more gyms, more fighters, that means more funding, and particularly you need train teachers of boxing. Unfortunately, the trainers today do not know how to teach boxing. The fighters succeed in spite of what they're being taught. The key things are not being shown to the fighters, and that would only make them more exciting. So you need a lot more fighters, more funding for the amateurs to develop a bigger base. The number of gyms around there, there are not enough gyms for those fighters. What are those key things you're saying they're not doing? You're asking a very technical question. <laughs> Some very technical questions here. I'm very impressed. The most important thing, if you go to any gym in the world, the one thing you don't hear from the trainers and their fighter, the one thing that's the most critical thing is move your head. You never hear that. The reason a fighter gets hit is because his head is right in the middle and it never moves. It has to go side to side or weave or weave but it doesn't do that. And the trainers don't know to teach that to their kids. If they taught it to the kids, the kids would be more exciting, they'd be more vicious in there, they'd be more confident in there, they'd be more fighters, but they don't teach that. I would have thought it would be move to your, move your feet. You know, what do I know? Well, that's, that's a good point, but it takes too long to move your feet, number one. And number two, the other guy is not punching at your feet. Yeah, He's sure. At your feet. <laughs> or 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 the best thing you could do is bite a guy's ear off. That usually wins and makes you famous. What do you think of that? That's good, but you, you know you should have an appetizer. <laughs> Steven, I had a another question for you. You say you've got all this memorabilia. I was going to end on that one, Charles. That was the end of the show. That was perfect. I wrapped it up. I had Tyson to bite in the ear. Oh, Next come on, better man. be good. Hey, you I can want, edit I, edit the show. Edit it. I, I want to see uh, what, what's your favorite piece that's sitting around you right now. 
You know, uh, what, what is it that really hits home for you that you've got around you right now? There's a hooker here about two, 10 feet away. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, so, oh, you mean that, don't you mean that type of piece? That, that's, that's boxing, boxing memorabilia. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I, okay. I have a pair of Mike Tyson. Oh, that could be a good ender right there. Yeah, <laughs> All right, y'all. We'll see you next week. Thanks a lot, Charles. <laughs> Thanks for ruining the show completely. <laughs> My mom just walked in the room and she's like, "What are y'all doing?" <laughs> she's like freaking out. Okay. So you say you had a pair of oh, Mike yeah. Tyson's? I have some Mike Tyson's boots <laughs> from his fights, you know, shoes. <laughs> and uh, I used to keep all that stuff. It was great. Um, uh, a lot of it is at the Hall of Fame. Uh, some trunks, some shoes, hand wraps, uh, mouthpieces. That's very rare for boxing to have equipment because boxers use the same stuff over and over. Uh, football, baseball, basketball, uniforms by the galore. Bats, uniforms, jerseys, everything. You see one football player has hundreds of things that he wears over his lifetime. Boxers know because there are so few fights and they wear the same thing over and over. Very right. rare. Stephen Lott, president of uh, the Hall of Fame, Boxing Hall of Fame. Tell everybody where they can go, what they can do, what they can see, and where this is opening up and how exciting it is for you. It's probably a lifelong dream, I mean, for all the stuff you've collected. Uh, wrap up the show here. Tell us about it. Well, hopefully, when you're in Las Vegas, you get a chance to come to the Luxor Hotel right on the Strip, on the mezzanine next to the Titanic and Bodies exhibit. There will be a sports attraction called Score, Halls of Fame, baseball, football, basketball, NASCAR, Within there, the new Boxing Hall of Fame. To be next to baseball and football puts boxing in a wonderful light. It's a great trip and a great experience at the score attraction at the Luxor. Anthony Ramos, Diana Ridley, Keith Knox, Robert Hanlon, Robbie Bincer, and of course, Charles Hoke, thanks for joining me. And of course, Stephen Lott, really appreciate your time. Some interesting stories, some great comments, and good luck with everything, and let's keep in touch. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care, everyone.